I have nothing good to share. This is something to hear from people and I encourage them to maybe start a podcast, maybe start a blog. But if you had an interview for a job, maybe your dream job, and I asked you, what do you have to share to our staff to make them better? I doubt you'd say, I have nothing of value to share. You would talk about all the great things you do, all the learning that you've had you know, in your years. But when it comes to writing a blog, trying something new, um, that's one of the reasons we often give, but is it really true? And I don't think it is. And the conversation with my guest today, Debbie Tannenbaum, it was really amazing to hear her journey about how she started a blog, maybe got into tech a little bit, and how that blog eventually turned into a book. And that book we're going to talk about in this space. And it was really authentic to listen to Debbie and hear this conversation, just kind of listening to her journey, how vulnerable she is and how she's kind of gone from the space where she's still learning. She's still trying to get better, but she's now published this book. And it's just a really inspiring conversation that we have. But I want you to think about as you're listening, um, all of all the things that you have a value to share, that the world would be better off if we all shared our gifts with one another. And not only does that elevate others, it, it elevates ourselves. It, it gives us the opportunity to make others better because of the wisdom we share, because of our knowledge. And it's not about bragging. It's not about boasting. It's about sharing your gifts with the world. And somebody out there is going to benefit from that. And I've been blessed to have amazing mentors, leaders, colleagues who have blessed me with their gifts, who have made me better. So I just want you to think about that as you're listening to the podcast. I hope you enjoy this episode of The Innovator's Mindset. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos. Welcome back to another episode of The Innovator's Mindset podcast. I am so blessed to have Debbie Tana Tannebaum uh, joining the podcast today. Uh, and she actually has a new book. It's called Transform, Techie Notes to Make Learning Sticky. And as we're recording this, congratulations, Debbie. It is a number one new release on Amazon, which is always, a, you know, a, it's, it's cool to see that. And uh, I'm looking at the, the bio here. This is a, as a veteran teacher. Let's see what it says. Debbie shares a journey from being a struggling teacher in the early 2000s to the educational technology coach she is today. Intertwining her story, she shares how a passion for using technology in the classroom uh, has ignited her, her through a myriad of experiences. And, and I, I love, um, I just love that kind of description. And there's more to it. And uh, for anyone, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the book, but you can check it out in the description down below. I think one of the things I just like about the description right away is it, it makes me feel that you're going to take me on a journey with you. So I'm not feeling like, oh, I can't do this stuff. It's like, hey, Debbie has grown in her yeah. practice and, you know, um, share that too. So, so uh, anyone check out the book and, and congratulations again. I know it's just released. So uh, kudos to you. I know uh, as someone who's written a book, it's not an easy process <laughs> and uh, seeing up there, it is, uh, it is a pretty cool thing. So Debbie, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for actually being a listener. We were talking yeah. about uh, my use of music, which I um, appreciate because I think it only excites me so that you actually know my theme song that's yes, kind of cool um, but debbie can you can you can you share everyone a little bit about who you are and and just your journey in education so this is my i'm finishing up my 21st year in education i am an elementary school tech coach in virginia so i get to work with students and teachers which is definitely what i love doing um i get to help the, i do some stuff where i'm part of the master schedule where i work with little kids the k to three kids with technology but i also get at least before COVID, right? This year has been a little different. I get to go mm -hmm. in grades four through six, do some co-teaching with teachers, really that embedded PD, which I love so much. And um, then in addition to that, I've been blogging for the last two and a half years, which I also love doing. And um, last year I started doing some presenting and on my birthday, my book came out. Oh, that's, that's, that's a perfect, did, was that planned no, or was that accidental? not at all. It was so funny because my publisher and I, like we were, he was on vacation, we're sending messages back and forth and he put it in on May 17th and I was like, maybe it'll happen on my birthday. Right. He goes, no, it's never that slow. And every day we kept checking and then <laughs> yeah, it was. on my birthday, he goes, oh, Amazon says there's a problem. It's probably going to be tomorrow. I'm like, are you kidding me? And then all of a sudden at noon, it just popped up and I was like, that's wow, awesome. like, that's so awesome. 
Hey, can I ask you, like, so you, you said you've been blogging for a couple of years. Did blogging um, help you? And I'm assuming it did, but maybe the better question is how, like, um, how did blogging help you get to that point where you did write a book? Well, I kind of feel like blogging kind of set me up for being ready to write a book. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the things that people have said when they've read my book is that it's really authentic and blogging really mm -hmm. helped me to be vulnerable. I remember when I read Be Real and then I re read Innovator's Mindset and uh, all of those things happened around the same time where mm -hmm. I didn't have a website. I part was participating, I think, in your Instagram book club and pe everybody was sharing their websites and I was just like, well, I don't have one. And I was also doing Edge of Magic mm -hmm. with Sam Fesich and I sent her a copy of this draft of a website and she's like, you need to publish this. People need to hear mm -hmm. your story. And I was terrified. Hmm. But the more I blogged, the at least I feel like the more it helps me and I, the fact that it resonates with other people just gives me so much joy. And like in 2021, I've been blogging like every three days. I've been super inspired. And oh, that's awesome. it's it, blogging really helped me to gain confidence in myself because it helps me work so much stuff out. Yeah, it, it's like um, as being someone who's blogged, who's written a book, who's published books. Um, one of the things that I always say to people that, you know, come to us and say like, Hey, do we want to write a book? I uh, like, do you have a blog? And they're like, no. I said, well, first of all, how do I know? Like, you're not necessarily building an audience. Uh, maybe you don't even know your writing style. And I think, uh, it's, it's kind of like writing a book without a blog is like running a marathon without doing some training, Absolutely. right? And not maybe doing some of the smaller races. And I think it helps you, as you said, kind of find your voice too, yeah. you know, and build that confidence as you go. Uh, I, I think for me, when I did uh, Innovator's Mindset, uh, I kind of knew what would resonate in some ways with people in the book because I had shared it in the blog. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, people would comment and sometimes I would revise things based on those comments. And it was like, it was just kind of like a crowdsourced book. So it was a really good process for me, but I didn't start blogging. Um, I didn't start blogging to uh, to write a book, I started blogging because I wanted to understand how does this impact kids? Like if kids were to write, you know, how do, what does that look like? It, it, the, I, I'm just, I'm curious of your thoughts of this and I don't know if this is gonna change. Do you, do you feel, and it's like I was speaking before I had a book, but then all of a sudden uh, people, I had a book and then people are like, oh, like George, the book, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I'm like, I've been writing for five or six years. Right. Right. Like it's Absolutely. not like, so, I, you know, because someone else said my stuff was good enough. Now it's like, now that gives me credibility. So like, it's just like, if you want to see if I have credibility, read my stuff and then right. that Absolutely. will tell you whether or not. Right. And, and I wonder about, um, will this generation see, it's kind of like, I, I know this is like a weird question to ask, but it's like being in a movie made you a celebrity. But now, like more people, there's a lot of people that have more TikTok followers than Will Smith, right? <laughs> like they have more, they have more clout than Will Smith. And so like, I wonder if, if that will change where, you know, maybe in education we see like, hey, uh, someone who blogs consistently is an author. They just might not have a physical book. I don't, I don't, I don't know your thoughts. Like do you, do you see like it gives you a different credibility that you have a book out or like does it change? Is that something that we see maybe a little bit different education. Just, just curious your thoughts. I just feel like, you know, and if you look at my book, like there's a lot of things in my book that, you know, were originally part of my blog right. that ended up trans, you know, transforming and changing to be part mm -hmm. of the book. Because when they first got, you know, my draft, they were like, you write like a blogger. I'm like, that's because I am a blogger. That's the point. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, so, you know, we had to definitely, you know, make some adjustments as we put it all together. But the blog to me is like snapshots. It's mm -hmm. like if you're looking at, you know, at a, a book and you have snapshots of photos versus the book is kind of putting it all in an album together and organizing it. Mm -hmm. So to me, I love blogging. It's not something mm -hmm. I'm going to give up. Um, but to me, the book was amazing and I loved it. And I'm also contributing to another book that's coming out in 2022 that um, is an edge of match book. And I'm right. I wrote a chapter on engagement, which was also really fun. But to me, they're two, they're, they're two different things, but they're a lot, they're the same. I spend 30 minutes trying to write every day. To me, writing is just part of my self care and blogging to me is part of that as well. Okay. I feel better that you said that because I feel like blogging is therapy for me. 
Absolutely. Right? Like There's I feel so many just, times yeah. where I'm trying to work something out and you can actually see it as I write it. I'm trying to work something out and it and blogging helps me work it out. So so actually like I I have shared that process for me and I'll like distinguish that. Like I'll say like, hey, sometimes I write to share my learning, but sometimes mm -hmm. I write to learn. And what I mean right. by that is actually writing is a way for me to process my process mm -hmm. my thoughts. And then uh, you kind of get to do that part. So that's, I, I'm glad I'm not the only one who feels that way. Cause I, it's, it's probably, I would say, um, you know, people talk about Twitter, Instagram, all that other stuff. Blogging has done the most for me for my learning. It's cause it's forced me to oh, like yeah. deeply reflect on education. Whereas I find Absolutely. Twitter is like those quick little, even, you know, even when it expanded to 240, 280 or whatever characters. Right. Like it, I actually have to, like a lot of times people say like, Hey, blah, 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 blah. And I'll say, yeah, read my blog post on that. And then they're like, no, or I'm not, I'm like, well, if you want my thoughts, right. Like I'm not getting in a Twitter argument, but if you really want to know what I think, I've written a blog post about this five years ago. So here you go. Right. Right. And I do that too. Yeah. Like if something comes up and I have a blog post about it, I'll, re I'll, I'll repost mm -hmm. it. But to me, when I'm sharing my blog post on Twitter, Twitter is just the place where people can access it. It's mm -hmm. just a way of, of, of dispersing it. You know, to me, Twitter is a lot, is a, a place for me to get information and share information, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so to me, it's not about sticking with the 200 and yeah. you know, 40 characters. To me, it's about, it's a quick place to get information. And if I see something that's interesting yeah. to me, then I can click on it and I can dig deeper. Yeah, and like I, I actually think there's a there's a powerful literacy in actually in Twitter that you have to be concise, uh, to the point. Try to you know share an idea in a limitation of characters, which I think is also a literacy that's important to develop. But uh, it, it's cool, and you know there, there's writing in that process as well too. So it, it's cool uh, to see that. So tell me, so your, your the book title is Transform Techie Notes to Make Learning Sticky, and uh, I am all about the, the sticky idea and tell mm -hmm. me, tell me, tell us a little bit about your book. So transform is actually an acrostic mm -hmm. It each chapter of the book is one of the letters and really it's my journey. And it talks about me going from when I first started teaching when things were kind of a little bit rough. Um, and it kind of takes you through that journey. And while doing that kind of gives you some weight, like a little bit of a framework that if you're having trouble working through it, you can do it as well. And so it's organized in three parts. The first part is like, you know, getting your feet wet. Mm -hmm. And it talk, chapter one talks about my story and takes you to when I found technology. Mm -hmm. And when I found technology was my first year of teaching and it changed my life. Like I said, I wanted to be an elementary school French teacher. Well, when I found technology, it's a mm -hmm. language of its own. Right. I was no longer interested in um, speaking right. French with my students. And then the book talks about what I call transform tech tools. They're mm -hmm. tools that give kids opportunities or anybody opportunities outside of the tech that you can have without mm -hmm. the tech. They're really versatile and you can use them for lots of different situations and that they, they do something to enhance. So it's not tech for the sake right. of tech, but it's tech because it gives you something else. Mm -hmm. And the sticky idea really came from when I first started being a tech coach, I was really struggling with my little kids teaching them technology. And I was listening to a podcast on um, the 10 minute teacher podcast and she, Vicki Davis was interviewing Pasa Avanava, and I probably didn't say her name right, and I feel bad about that. And she was talking about how she taught her kids icons to help them have something to hold on to when they were learning about computers. Mm. And I love this idea because I had felt like I was playing whack-a-mole with my right. students. One would pop up, boop, right. boop, boop. And I started teaching them icons and like a morning message type thing where I had the icons on the board. And all of a sudden, things started to change. And... My students started to, you know, instead of asking me questions, they were looking at the morning message and I was able to point to the symbols and we kept building on that. And eventually we made this word wall up of icons in my computer lab. And not only were the kindergartners paying attention to it, but even my fifth and sixth graders started to. And so I started using it for everyone. And that's where Techie Notes originally came from was because I was trying to give them something sticky mm -hmm. to, you know, get to, you know, have their learning hold on to. And so in that part of my book, I really talk about ways to nurture and empower student agency. I really, really strongly mm -hmm. believe in student agency and creation over consumption. 
And so I really want to make it so that no matter what age your students are, you provide right. them the tools so that you're not feeling like you're always answering questions, but instead students are actually doing the learning versus, you know, what else, you know, just playing, you know. Yeah. Yeah, like when you say the, the idea, for example, like creation over consumption, I think a lot of people uh, misinterpret that, like don't don't actually get information. It's like, I think, no, it's about evolving to do something with this information, to actually creating something Absolutely. valuable uh, from that process. And I think that, you know, it takes learning uh, to, to a next level. And it's probably, you know, a variation of Bloom's taxonomy when we're looking at um, what we learned, yeah. whatever, how many years ago. But uh, I'd be curious, like how... Um, that would be evolved in a world where, you know, technology is so predominant, where we have that opportunity to create much easier uh, in many ways. Yeah. And when you talk about this and you kind of share some of your ideas and some of the things that you've seen actually as valuable to students, when you work with adults, what are some of the strategies they have? Because like, let's be honest, like a lot of teachers just say like, nah, I don't need, I don't need this. I don't need this work. Um, like what are some of the, maybe some of, what are some of the obstacles that you faced, you know, through trying to work other teachers to see value and maybe how did you overcome that process? Well, I think just like with, you know, our students, it's all mm -hmm. about relationships. And, you know, that's one of the reasons that I loved being able to go into teachers' classrooms and work with them because, you know, you would have a teacher who would embrace it and be raring to go. And right. then you might have a teacher who right. wouldn't. Well, by the end of the year, everybody was embracing it because it just became part of the culture. And when the and you know it it wasn't something extra to do, but we would take a lesson that the teachers were yeah. already doing, and we would find a way to use the technology in such a way that it gave the kids something to hook onto or an opportunity that they wouldn't have without it. So then the teachers started to see value, and I was there to support them. It's really hard mm -hmm. to take risks, and. Sometimes you just need somebody there telling you it's okay or showing you it's okay. And there were many times with teachers where the first time I would come in to do something, I would do it and they would help. And then the second time we right. would switch roles. And so I think that's really important. And, you know, and my goal is, you know, I want my teachers to understand that technology is wonderful for students, but, you know, it's also wonderful right. for teachers. And so... In the second part of my book, I talk really about that whole idea of empowering teachers and take it to that level. And I really have tried with my teachers to say to them, we're going to take this slow. I'm happy to come in and work with you, and but take it in small, manageable steps. I'm not right. trying to change everything because that's not good pr practice. We want to make sure that the, ped you know, the teaching comes first and the technology amplifies the teaching. Yeah, and like, I, I think for anyone listening, and I think a lot of people think, like working with colleagues and um, with technology will be different than doing it with curriculum, right? But it's not, it's still ruining relationships. And uh, when you when you said that, one of the things that I did, and I, I talked about this uh, in greater detail in the Innovator's Mindset, um, I would actually book these sessions with staff one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, they could basically ask whatever they wanted. And we would sit there for 40 minutes they, and just such a varying level. And I think a lot of times when we, and I think there's great value to do that in a classroom, but I think sometimes there's a, a different vulnerability level when you're in a room and you're not worried about kids seeing you screw up or maybe not knowing what you're doing, or, you know? Um, and mm -hmm. it, it was amazing to build those one-on-one -on -one relationships. And it all, and it, like, I remember some, I'd say like, Hey, like, what do you want to learn? Like, not like, didn't come there with an agenda. didn't go with that process. But, yeah. uh, sometimes you'd say, like, I want to learn Twitter. I'm like, well, I don't know if that's like the best thing that you should do. Like, why do you want to learn Twitter? And they give me a reason like, Oh, everyone else is using it. I'm like, oh, that's not a good reason. So just, just like you, I said, <laughs> you know, like, Hey, let's, what are you doing? Like, what do you do in your curriculum? And like, right. how can I help you with that? And like, we would look at that and it just was amazing to see their growth. But a lot of times when we try to move um, a staff forward, we try to do it as a whole, but when you do it at the individual level, you build yeah. expertise amongst the staff and then they start to spread that message yeah. too. And I think one of the things, especially with technology uh, is, is really important. And I think it's with anything that we're trying to implement, it shouldn't be an addition to what you're doing. It should make us think differently right. about what we're doing and make it better. And not like, hey, you must do all Absolutely. these things plus now add this. It's like, no, let's like rethink this 
so we can do it better, maybe even save you time, uh, have that connection, right? And so yeah. like just kind of thinking about that, um, like how, like, do you maybe have an example of like one way that you've seen teachers um, utilize technology in a classroom uh, to redo what they were doing before that made it better, maybe save them time? Like what, what, what's an example you might have of that? So, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking also about a lot of, like mm -hmm. I did a lot of open office hours during this, but the thing that kind of really comes out first is the idea of using Pear Deck. We're a Pear Deck district, we're not a Nearpod district. But when I first started using Pear Deck before the pandemic, teachers saw value in it, but when we were in virtual learning and teachers mm -hmm. needed to engage their students, it became a game changer. And even now that we're back in the building for the most part, and we have some kids at home, knowing that you can have one or two, you know, a three or four kids raise their hand and answer a question, or you can engage everybody and see how everybody's doing and give people feedback from your teacher dashboard. Well, that's something you can't do without the technology. It's impossible. Yes, back in the day, we might have done mm, that with those right. clickers and things like that, but it still wasn't that same impact. And I've been amazed, especially as my kindergarten teachers have worked with Pear Deck, they have found ways to connect with kids and find out what kids know that I would have never thought of. And I, you know, like you said, I did right. do some training sessions, but I also had these open office hours where teachers would be like, I want to try this with my kids, but I'm unsure. Mm -hmm. And we would just practice, you know, in a, in a virtual setting. And I think that, you know, those things are really important. Or I, I would be like, they would say, can you come in? I'm trying it for the first time. So I think that like, that's one of, to me, one of the biggest successes of this year is that teachers weren't using it because right. it was a technology tool. They were using it because they couldn't, that's how they, how they teach now. And when it came to the end of the year, there was no question if we were buying Pear Deck for this coming year, mm -hmm. Pear Deck is now part of our school culture. It's not something extra. It's something mm -hmm. we do to reach students. So and, I, I got to ask you students. this because I know you, so I know you, what is your title currently? Oh, it's awful. Um, okay, school based well, technology okay, so specialist. School -based, so, Spitz. so here's something that I've <laughs> always talked about, and I'm curious of is that so you're like you have an education degree, you trained to be a teacher, um, mm -hmm. you developed a, an ability with technology, you work with colleagues, and like where a lot of times I'm guessing you have to fix things because right. And it's, and oh, it's yeah. like, that's, that's not, yeah. that's not your role. That's not was the intent of your role. Um, right. But it, like, it, like intent, it's yes. like, we, you know, we have <laughs> IT, to, like in my school district, we have IT departments that are meant to do that stuff. Now I would never say no, if I could fix something on the fly, but I think sometimes right. that's like, I, I kind of had this, I remember like when I had some of those roles, it was like anything with electricity was now my problem. Right. Yeah, I know. <laughs> there was some, somebody asked yeah. me how to fix a copier one day, and yeah, I was right. like, "I, I, I sat, no someone idea. actually asked me about uh, <laughs> uh, they had like Christmas lights." I'm like, "I don't know. I don't. I don't have Christmas lights. I don't like. I don't know. I, I don't know what. I, what does that have to do with me? Right? And and so like, where do you find that kind of maybe that balance of like, yeah, we like of course because like if things don't work, you can't. You know, people are going to push it away. So like, where do you find that balance of like? you know, helping with some of that stuff that's maybe not your role, but to get to the point where we are doing deeper learning with technology. Well, I think especially at the beginning of the year to me, helping out mm -hmm. with some of those things as a relationship builder, I think it's really important. I right. want staff to know that they can come to me, but I also want them to understand that my technology support knowledge is more limited. Now, obviously I've been doing this job for three years now. It's, yeah. I have more knowledge than I did then. Um, but many times I end up being, you know, I'll, I'll try, I do that initial triaging. And if it's beyond my abilities, then I'm able to then direct it to our tech support specialist. But, you know, with, we're, I'm a school of a thousand kids and we will have a thousand devices next right. year. We have um, about a thousand now. That's a lot of computers to care yeah. for. So sometimes I do understand that, you know, there are other things that I get tasked with. And I think that it's really challenging because especially in my district, elementary school tech coaches are on the master schedule for 10 hours. So there's a lot of different parts of your role. And, you know, and in this particular year, it was all hands on deck. So, I mean, I've done everything this year. I watch kids during lunch. Mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, I hold the door open in the mornings. 
you know, I've done lots of things that would not have traditionally been in my role, but you know, we're all here to do what we yeah, can. Yeah, and kids, like and as a, as I'm listening part. to you and thinking uh, about this, uh, like there's probably no one in education that gets just to do their job, right? Like nobody just no nobody gets just no, to do what they sign up not. for, right? And whether that's a good thing or not, so I you know kind of yeah. puts it in perspective for myself because understanding like yeah, like there's probably a lot of things that uh, teachers do. Uh, that they never signed up for, but it's part of the role. And uh, I think we yeah. have to learn to say no to things when they're like, no, nah, that's that's not anywhere near my role. Uh, because I think, uh, unfortunately, it's, yeah. it, I think a lot of people take advantage of the teacher's willingness to say yes and try and you know be helpful to other people. And that sometimes leads to burnout for individuals. Yeah. But um, we're, we're going into the, what, 2021, 2022 school year. And... Uh, I'm curious uh, what, after, you know, pandemic teaching, all that stuff, like, what do you see, like, next year? Like, what what, what do you see is, and I'm assuming um, it's going to be somewhat back to normal, and I say normal in the sense of, uh, like, how we saw maybe a typical classroom in 2019 in, in like, where we're seated and maybe mass off. And I don't know, I, I know every state's different. So, like, what do you see coming up um, for the next year? I'm not really sure. I feel mm -hmm. like it's, like, we've gone through so many changes. We're told that we're going to be in school five days a week. Um, but I also know that right. we'll have some sort of virtual academy as an option for kids who opt, who can, who apply to it. Um, I think it's going to be a really interesting year because I've seen a lot of, well, now that we're face-to-face, -face, we right. don't need technology feeling. And I think... We're officially going one-to-one -one next year um, in my county and elementary school, and I think there's really going to need to be, you right. can't be either extreme. You can't use technology for everything, and you can't not use technology. There's really going to need to be a shared understanding of what blended learning is, um, and I think that that's going to be super, super important, that teachers are really going to need to understand why are they using the technology and when they don't want to use, when they're not using it, why they're not using it. I think there's just a lot of intentionality that's going to need to be built into that. And I think that, you know, it's, that's going to take time. I mean, mm -hmm. we've done so many pivots so quickly in the past 18 months that, you know, really require teachers to literally, you know, like, you know, Friday we would do one thing, Monday it's something else. So I really think, and I hope that, you know, in our district, we're right. being given some professional development time during the summer to plan things. And I really think that teachers need to, and I'm, hoping to be able to work with them for that really understand why are we using the technology because every kid will have a computer but that doesn't mean kids should be on computers all day long and so you know really understanding that are we putting kids on computers so that they can play a computer game or are they on computers because they're creating right. you know a blog or a video or something like that to show their understanding of something I think it's going to be extremely important in the coming year to really make sure that we're focused. Yeah, and I, I think the, the or misconception sometimes with one-to-one um, -one for, for maybe people that aren't as comfortable and familiar with that is that this now means kids should be on computers all day. And that's not what it is at all. For me, I think it's, right. it's important to understand you have access to those devices all day. That doesn't mean you use them all day. Right. And so like you go to the other level where, um, where remember, I don't know if this is a practice anywhere anymore, but you know, you'd have that cart, you wheel it in, you, you would like force it, you know, to use it during that, that time and then you put it away. <laughs> but the difference is like, Hey, you grab the computer when you need, you grab the device. Right. And that's like, if you really think about it, we do that as adults all the time. Right. Like I grab right. my phone when I need my phone for certain things I do on my phone, yeah. but if I have to do like, for me, I go to my computer for certain things, but I'm not on my computer all day. Right. And a lot of my day on, a, on technology is right. recording podcasts, is editing, is writing. It's actually, I would say like my consumption is probably less than half of what I do on a computer. It's mostly creating stuff. Um, when you, when right. you talked in the, in the, in the, um, the description of your book, you, you talked about kind of your growth, your process. So somebody could be listening to this podcast. And I think like, I actually think uh, there's more technology use, not because more people are better with technology. I think technology has become so easy that we don't really think about it. Right. Like, yeah, I, yeah. I think I was actually better with a computer 
uh, when I was a kid and we had an Apple IIc and like you could barely do anything with that, right? Like you, I, I knew some programming, <laughs> I did that stuff. I don't know any coding, yeah. I don't know any of that anymore because like somebody does that already. And so someone who's new you to maybe, you know, uh, pushing themselves with technology, doing something different, you know, maybe wanting to start a blog, maybe wanting to try something different. Like what advice would you give them to start? Well, you know, mm-hmm. I think that the biggest thing I could say is you just need to get started. You know, as I was going and describing my book, the first part, like I said, is really focused on the student. The second part really talks about that whole idea of the PLN, the seeking connections beyond your school, finding those people. And then, you know, at mm-hmm. the end, I really talk about that idea of offering your voice. And offering your voice can mean so many different things. For me, it started off with blogging and with Twitter chats because I was super intimidated about all of that because mm-hmm. I didn't know if I had anything to say that people cared about. And, you know, it's been a process for me to understand that what I have, what I say has value and that what I say is going to be different from what anybody else says, but I can also learn from others. And so to me, blogging was a natural way of doing this because. I've always liked to write, but mm-hmm. as I gained more confidence then right. I was like, well, if I can do this, I can do more things. And that confidence continues to build and you continue to try to do new things. I, you know, I got the contract for this book and I waited right. two weeks to sign it because I was just like, whoa, <laughs> like I didn't know what, to, like, I was like, somebody wants to give me a publishing contract. Like I was afraid because it was a level I'd never been at. And I really feel like when people want to are afraid, Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes they just have to get started. You know, I, someone's like, well, how did you write a book? I'm like, well, it started off as, you know, letters and they became words and paragraphs, but it really is that when you start writing, it starts off with individual letters and you're really building on. And I would joke that I'd have each of the chapters as a separate Google doc. And where, when I felt like this was the chapter I needed to work on, I'd go work on it. And it would just keep building. And all of a sudden I was like, wow, I have a lot of words now. Um, But I feel like sometimes we're our biggest obstacles. Because I grew up thinking that if you were afraid of something, don't do it. And I'm very lucky that my husband is amazing. And he's really pushed me to go outside of my comfort zone. And it wasn't until like two years ago that I started to believe it. We've been married almost seven years. And now that I believe it, like... You know, he, he and I talk and he's like, I can't believe you're doing all this stuff. And I'm like, well, I can. And he, I was like, mm-hmm. you always told me it was inside of me. And now I just know it's inside of me. And it's, you know, and I love helping others see that too, because I mm-hmm. got to where I am because of other people encouraging me and helping me. And I think that idea of we, the education community is the most supportive community I think I've ever encountered. And I joked when I went to ISTE in 19, I was like, oh my God, all these people who are famous, they're so nice. Well, they're so nice because they're people. And at some point, somebody's going to come up to me mm-hmm. and think that I'm famous. But I'm a person too, you know? And I just think that's so important. People, I mean, you know, I reached out to Casey Bell because she was one of the people who I first connected with on mm-hmm. social media. And I asked her if she'd write the that's forward. Awesome. I thought it was a total stretch. But she did it. So it just kind of shows you that. You know, you just never know. I asked people mm-hmm. to do pre-reads. I was like, oh, they're never going to say yes. They they did. And I just, I've connected with so many amazing people through my interactions online. Yeah, and, and the, the, one of the things I try to live my life about is the idea of like, be humble or be humble. Like one or the other is going to happen. So uh, I'd rather kind of take mm-hmm. that, you know, myself, but the, um, right. you know, kind of thinking about how many people have helped me get to do things that I get to do. The, the one thing I, you know, as a piece of advice to anybody, because I know the same feeling is that you have like, like, who cares what I have to say? Uh, here's an easy way to get over it. If you were applying for a job and they were interviewing and saying, hey, what value would you bring to the school? There is no way you would say, eh, not really anything. I don't really have anything to share. You'd be like, I do this, I do this, I do this. Right, exactly. But then when we put ourselves in the world, all of a sudden we have nothing good to share. Well, if you were interviewed for a job, you wouldn't be saying that. So, you know, this is just think about that job interview. Right what you'd say that you have to share and, and, and then start sharing that too. And um, it, it's really cool. And I think really inspiring to see you start from that place being nervous. And now you have a book and, you know, people are learning from you. And I, and I know just talking to you, how many people yeah. helped you on your journey. And I've been watching how you are helping people on their journey. And I think that's something I'm really passionate about. 
So I really appreciate you being on the podcast. And uh, anyone, check out Debbie's book, Transform Teching Notes to Make Learning Sticky. Thank you so much. Congratulations on the book. Yeah. And so thanks, everyone, for listening. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you.